So most people thought the Toy Story story had come to a conclusion at Toy Story 3. What brings us back to Toy Story 4? Well, should we tell me we all, we all yeah. thought that? <laughs> we thought it too. <laughs> we thought it was over. Yeah, we thought that, uh, well, we enjoy the end of Toy Story 3 just as much as everybody else. And so when the idea of a fourth one came up, we, we were thinking, well, what is next for Woody? And that kind of became the, the answer to the question as well, which is, well, what is next for him? So I'd say that the uh, just exploring where you go from there and see how Woody's life is continuing after 3 is, was kind of the inspiration for this. Can you describe the themes that we'll find in Toy Story 4? Well, we talked a lot about, just kind of going off of that, it's really about second chances. I mean, it's a film that I think what inspired us was exactly thinking about, okay, what, what happens if you do everything you've done kind of the correct way, you land on your feet, and this assumption that it's never going to be the same. So this idea of giving everyone a second chance, uh, uh, sort of about transition, everything's changed, Bonnie's going to, you know, to kindergarten, and Woody's in a new room, and all the characters are sort of, uh, sort of in a new place, so we really sort of, I think we're inspired by that as a theme. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bo Peep was another big inspiration for this right. film. We knew early on, you know, we hadn't seen her since two, and it was time to kind of bring her back, and the idea of Woody reconnecting with her after all these years intrigued us, and kind of building her character into one that would really challenge Woody's kind of point of view and world view of just what the world could be for a toy. Uh, Bo's living this lost toy life, and we love the idea of kind of pairing that with Woody, who's kind of been safely in, in a child's room and always been all about his kid. Yeah. So kind of flipping that on its head a little bit. And how um, how's Woody and Buzz's relationship evolved? Yeah, I mean, Woody and Buzz have, have been best friends since the first one, and we, we really did take that into account for this film. I don't think this film could exist without their friendship, so in a way, um, the way that they've involved where he goes from kind of resenting him and then all of a sudden becoming best friends, their close friendship is essential for this film. We like that they, they have this sort of working, deep working friendship relationship. Like they, at this point, they don't even need to finish e their sentences they're speaking. They kind of know what each other's mm -hmm. thinking without speaking. And there's a lot of great animation that we're proud of that uh, it really shows, I think, a progression. Sure. Yeah, they've really supported each other in these films, um, especially the last few, and been through so much, even like facing fire together. But there's there's a new, they're kind of put to the test, that relationship is put to the test in a new way. I'd say like us. Form. Like us, oh, yeah, exactly that's like true. us. <laughs> Just like Woody and Buzz, uh, Tim and Tom really bring something together oh, for this for sure. film. Can you tell how that shaped? Yeah. Well, they've been doing these characters for 25 years, and so they, you know, we'd, We'd, it was great just to hear them read the dialogue because you go, oh, that's Woody. Or, or you hear it, you go, oh, that's not Woody because it's just, you, you know, we didn't get it quite right. And, and so hearing their influence uh, in the, on the stage as well, they go, what if we tried it like this? You go, oh, that's, that's perfect. Yeah. So they know these characters so well that it was just uh, such a gift to work with. Who is Forky and why does he exist? <laughs> yeah, who's Forky? Uh, Forky? Forky's all of us. He's all of us. <laughs> Forky, I mean, Forky's came off this idea, I think, came up in the story room of, you know, what if we could explore a new kind of toy? You know, we're always looking for new ideas and toy truths, we call them. Yeah. It, it was kind of based on this observation that we've all had with our kids of um, they make things and they're creative or, or, or that kind of idea of a kid open a Christmas present and plays with the box. Like, it's all of a sudden, is that a toy? We started batting that around and laughed. Yeah, it just kind of came out of a joke. We were just saying, what if he, if Bonnie picked up a rock and started playing with it, is that a toy? Like, we, we did, didn't know, but yeah. then we started thinking that would be funny if a toy all of a sudden came to life and didn't understand anything. So yeah, he's something really new in this film, kind of one of the new kinds of toys. We've never seen a handcrafted toy come to life before. And he just immediately causes all sorts of problems and challenges <laughs> yeah. for Woody and sort of everybody in the room just because he doesn't understand what it means to be a toy. Um, what is the relationship between Forky and Woody and how does that, how does Forky underscore Woody's story? Yeah, the, um, when we had the idea of introducing Forky, we knew we couldn't go like uh, too jealous with Woody like because he's already gone through that with, with, uh, with Buzz in the first film. So when he's introduced to the room, Woody immediately takes him on as a mentor. He takes, takes uh, Forky on as a, he's yeah. his mentor. Mm -hmm. So to explain what it means to be a toy and what it means to be like the most important toy in the room uh, to Bonnie. It's kind of a, it's sort of an echo of Buzz and Woody in Toy Story 1 in a way, right? A little, yeah. It, it comes into bit. his life and Woody's got to deal with it. But he's mature it. enough that he takes it 
he does, he's not jealous of it. He he acknowledges that this guy is important right. in a way that he doesn't understand yet. Yeah, and Forky really gives us the chance to have Woody vocalize in this film the importance of what it means to be a toy and to be there for your child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He gives us the chance because he's got to explain all that to Forky so we get a real idea of what's going on in Woody's head in this movie because of Forky. One of my favorite parts is when he acknowledges that his time with Andy, that Woody had his time with Andy and Forky's never even doesn't even know who Andy is, but we all do. And I just, I just love that. Forky moment. says it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Tony Hale brings Forky to life. <clears throat> Absolutely. Tell us about Tony Hale. I mean, uh, uh, Tony Hale's the first name that came to us when we were thinking of this character. Uh, Tony, uh, I love everything he's been in, everything he does, and he, he uh, just he's plays in, an innocent character mm -hmm. so well. Mm -hmm. That's also um, lovable and full of heart and and hilarious, and he does all that so well. And, and he, he is Forky. <laughs> we, yeah. You can imagine, like, we, we had to write him a letter and reach out to him and try to describe Forky. It was a hard letter to write. And I remember him calling and asking, <laughs> as you would if you got a letter like that. He asked, well, who, who's this guy? You know, what's he about? I think we said something like, well, he's, a, he's not quite sure why he's here. And he's having a little bit of an existential crisis. He goes, oh, I'm your guy. I can, I can play that. He's insecure. Yeah. Got yeah. it. I can do like, that. He's asking the question, why am I alive? Yeah. He's like, I've got that. He's, yeah. I get it. He knew how to do it. So we love Tony. He's a, we're very lucky he jumped in with us. Um, how does uh, Woody reunite with Bo Peep in the film? We, we get to the chance to really bring those two back together and in a kind of a surprising way. Woody's, they've gone on this big kind of RV trip adventure. Forky has jumped out and Woody's kind of main goal is like, how do I get Forky and get him back to the RV? And through happenstance, they kind of end up on a playground. And so it's really on, on the, in this playground setting and it's in a way that you wouldn't expect where a child picks them both up and they come face to face sort of after all these years, but they're in toy mode. They can't react, they can't talk to each other and they're just looking into each other's eyes. And it's a really, it's a really sweet moment. Yeah, we thought of that kind of as our Casablanca moment of, you know, of all the, all the uh, sandboxes and all the playgrounds yeah. and all the world, <laughs> like he out. comes into mind. So it, that, I love that part is because it's just something you can only do in a Toy Story movie. You can't do that anywhere else. And uh, describe Woody's relationship with Bo as the film progresses. Well, I think we, we set up, Woody's always, if you remember the first three films, he's always, he's always cared for her, he's always loved her. She's always been this anchor to him, even, even in, the, in Toy Story 1 and 2. She's the one that's always kind of reminded him who he was. She says, you know, look at your boot, remember who you are, and you know, kind of pick yourself back up. And, you know, sadly, she, you know, she was taken from the group, and, and we, we talk about that in 3. So I think he's always pined for her a little bit. Yeah. He, he, he clearly loves her, and when he sees her after all these years, he, he, you know, he, he can't believe it. So I think he's... When he first sees her, he's a little bit old Woody. He's, um, you know, I'm here, I'm going to help you, we're going to get to where we need yeah. to go. And I think she, you know, our, the, the twist of the film is that she's actually the one that maybe a few steps ahead of him in, in this case. And it takes him a minute to, yeah, he, to catch up to that. He quickly discovers he's not in a world he, that he's right. ever been in before. He doesn't understand it. But she's Bo kind does. of a symbol of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the contrast between uh, Bo Peep's attitude and personality and her porcelain physique? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was that was something that we were very careful about. I mean, we always knew she's porcelain, and that was always the intent from the very first film. And now we have the ability in the computer just to make it look absolutely stunning. And so we wanted to make sure that she wasn't flipping around and, and landing like Thor, you know, in every scene, and right. where she would just shatter. But uh, she's very smart about the way she moves around. So she does. Uh, run around out in the world and she can break and everything but she is smart about how she how she does it she's, also, she's tough and just independent and sort of fierce and you can yeah. see yeah. when she does break she just tapes herself back up and just keeps going we also meet team Bo. so what is team Bo's purpose in the film team Bo, her friends Bo. her like um yeah we got we got no, giggle Car mcdimple the carls. The carls yeah i think that they, they show that she's She's been out in the world, she's made new friends, she's kind of re, I don't know, claimed her place as a toy in the world a little bit. She's not waiting around for a kid and she's surrounded herself with toys that I guess think a little bit like her and have wised up a little bit beyond the, the bedroom of a kid. And they're her best friends, her kind of giggle sort of stands as her conscious a little bit. Mm -hmm. she, uh, Cricket. She's the smallest character in Toy Story but she's got one of the biggest voices, you know. <laughs> um, and of course the Carls, I mean they've made this career out of Getting, finding creative ways of getting played with. You know, they still, they're still after that, but in a, in a different way. But they're all lost toys. They're all yeah. toys that have been mm -hmm. discarded or left behind in a playground. And, and now they've, it's kind of like a, 
the those boys in uh, the Lost Boys in yeah. Neverland. You know, yeah. they they have come together as a as a group in, a, in a, their own kind of family unit. And she's got her sheep. She's <clears> still <throat> very much the parent of her three-headed sheep. Yeah, They're, they play a very important role in this film. <laughs> They're also quite talented in this film. <laughs> yeah, they are. able to even they, drive remote control cars. They do a lot. That's what three-headed sheep do. <laughs> That's like, what they do. We just really they've come along the research. Yeah. Yeah. They've come along long yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and what does Annie Potts bring to the role? Oh man, everything. And she's amazing. Yeah, this movie would not exist without Annie Potts. She she can um, she can do anything. She she I just fall in love with her every time I watch this film. Um, she just brings so much to the character and to the role and to the story and, and this, the, the, I just love this movie is, is, is Bo Peep. I do too. She brings this effortless grace and charm where I think it makes it work that she's a porcelain doll but has a toughness. Annie can Sarcasm somehow, too. yeah, she's funny. She can just thread those needles and bring that character to life. And I just remember her saying even early on like, oh, the, she's saying different things in this. Mm -hmm. Like she speaks, holds herself differently. She was kind of observing it through the lines and then she just brought it yeah. to a, a level we never, never thought, thought we could get. We brought her and Tom Hanks together, usually making these animated films we'll record one actor at a time, but we actually had her and Tom do their scenes together for a few sessions yeah. just because the chemistry between them was so important in this movie and it was really cool. It was special for them too because they had never recorded with another actor in a voiceover session right. like this. So that was pretty, pretty Very amazing. Cool. After that first session, I think that was our first session, mm -hmm. first recording session. After that first one, we were like, oh, this is gonna work fine, you know. Who are Ducky and Bunny and what do they bring to the Toy Story <laughs> universe? <laughs> I, Ducky and Bunny are two uh, carnival toys that have never been with a kid before. They've been hanging up in a carnival booth for years, uh, which is, by the way, the worst possible existence for a toy is what we imagine. Yeah. So you're just kind of hanging there as bait for people to come up and spend their money. And you'll never get one because those games are impossible to win. <laughs> uh, but that what, that's what makes those characters so much fun is that they are kind of these, not outcasts, but they are uh, kind of on the fringe and they have this viewpoint that's just from a carnival lifestyle, which yeah. is so much fun. So Key and Peele are just in, are amazing and, as uh, Ducky and Bunny. They're, they bring a ton of humor to this. They're just, they're really funny. And yeah, yeah. Key and Peele are another couple guys that we recorded them together, their chemistry, they've worked together for so many years. They just, there's a lot of improv that they did and brought to the sessions. They were just riff back and forth off each other. They just really became these two toys and brought something really great it to it. It was hard not to laugh during their takes. We wrecked a lot of takes. We wrecked a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Who is Gabby Gabby and how are audiences going to perceive her? Gabby Gabby is uh, voiced by Christina Hendricks. And she is a, a toy that's been stuck in this antique store for over 60 years now. Um, we th think of her as our, kind of our Norma Desmond, where she's not just stuck in this antique store, but stuck in time as well. So when Woody comes into the store and he has what she needs, which is a w working voice box, uh, she quickly becomes our villain. Hopefully the audience perceives her as a villain first, and then uh, once Woody starts to understand her, the audience starts to empathize with her as well. And how is she not so different from Woody? She has the same goal that Woody has always had for all these films, which is to be there for a kid. Like any other toy, that's their purpose, and she has that same thing. And I think Woody um, comes to understand that and can see himself at the fact that she's stuck in this cabinet. It's kind of similar to him being stuck in the, the closet at the beginning of the movie as well. So he really does start to see himself, but without the fact that he, she had a kid. They're both potentially even from the same manufacturer. They're about made from the 50s, about same the years. same year, so they had that in common. And how did Christina Hendricks uh, help bring this character to life? Well, oh man. I mean, Christina, like like the rest of this cast, I mean, she, we always look for people that are they're gonna kind of bring truth to these characters, you know, not come in and do a cartoon voice or put on anything, just be who they are. And Christina, I think she just was able to thread that needle of appeal and sweetness, but with an edge. Like she can mm -hmm. quickly turn it to almost this terrifying clip of, of um, seriousness, I guess. And it's just, it's just a great piece of acting to be able to do that. And so that's, and that's what Gabby is, you know? She's a baby doll. She's the sweetest, most beautiful, cute thing, but can also look right through you. you yeah, know? she's had time to think about this yeah. for a long time, and so she knows exactly what, would ha what she would do if somebody that had what she needs comes into the, uh, into the store. Uh, can you describe the setting of this film and um, any of the tech? logical advances that were used. 
Yeah, so I mean, one thing that excited us about this is getting these toys sort of up and out of the Tri-County area. So it's really this RV trip adventure where they go outside the comfort of, of the Bonnie's room, the comfort of the area, and, and they're meeting these, they meet a bunch of toys that they've never met before, really changes up their environment. Um, we always had an antique store kind of in, in at the core of the story, and that's where Bo Peep was going to be in our initial incarnations of this. But maybe midway through our development process, we decided to, just, to take that antique store outside of town and mm -hmm. actually have it be somewhere that's a destination for them on this trip because it was intriguing to us and we all sat forward thinking about these toys really outside their comfort zone and, right. and where, where the danger was real and whether where it was gonna be a real challenge um, for them to kind of track down Forky and bring him back to safety and kind of set up the ticking clock of that RV trip potentially leaving them behind forever. And it was that store that was a big technological challenge. There's 10,000 items in that store and uh, we had to build and model every single one of those and then have it set dressed in there to make it look like it was just casually placed. Uh, and then uh, we used a lot of our back lot to do that as well. So there's props and things from other movies, other Pixar films mm -hmm. that have been placed in there as, as Easter eggs. Why do you think gra uh, audiences gravitate towards these characters in Toy Story? Well, we've always, we've always talked about it's like they're toys first. It, you know, and everyone, we think, everyone has always secretly believed that, you know, our toys come to life when we're not looking. And the first Toy Story movies sort of a receipt that that's true. Like mm -hmm. everyone everyone bought that premise. But I think what's under that is uh, we've worked hard to make these characters feel real. I mean, they're believable. They're, they they have emotions and fears and, and, and kind of blind spots that I think, I think most people that, that you might know would. And so they feel, we like to think, like Woody just feels like a real person that, that you would know or care about or that would, you know, be somewhat imperfect, I guess. Um, and just the combo of those two things has clicked in a way that audiences uh, around the world have, have um, really embraced, embraced it all. And what do you think uh, the audiences will uh, take away from the new characters that are so fabulously uh, <laughs> hilarious in this film? The hope is that, that they just fit in seamlessly to the world and that uh, they have as much fun discovering these characters as Woody and Buzz and Bo do as well. Um, I, that was one of the most fun parts we had working on this film was creating these new characters. There's a lot of humor that comes out of these new characters too, just in, in who Forky is. Duke Kaboom brings a lot of just, just humor. Ducky and Bunny. Ducky and Bunny bring some of the biggest yeah. laughs in the film. We love those characters. But yeah, Forky really turns the thing on its head, yeah. uh, really mm -hmm. by being kind of this, this wrench in the works for Woody and, and for the gang and, and kind of messes things up for them in a way that sets yeah. this adventure in motion. I asked my daughter, it's like, what's, what her favorite characters are in Toy Story? And she's like, Slinky, Bo Peep, and Bunny. Very specific. <laughs> and I thought it was funny, but it was a nice spread of old and new, Slinky I thought. Like, and she was like, Dad answered. So it, <laughs> it gave me confidence. It's like, oh, they're embraced somehow as part of the, you know, part of the family. Already. <laughs> so.